For years, Paul Zigo has claimed, bring on the nukes. But when the nukes come, he is the first to cry, cowering in the corner. This is the nukes, deep fat fried. Deep fat fried! Yeah. I'm glad that loser Paul's ego isn't here. <laughs> Me too, dude. Me too, Gwildor. I've brewed a potion for you all to drink. Cool. Looking I thought you were a scientist, it. though. I am a scientist. A well, potion you... scientist. <laughs> potion scientist. Yes! I've never heard of that. Look at my wizarding staff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yes? It's got some technology on the yes. tip there, yeah. Yes. So you got kind of like a cyberpunk thing going on? Yes. Cool. I dig it. Dude, Gwildor invented cyberpunk shit, dude. I was I was cyberpunk before cyberpunk was cool. I like it. He's a hipster, too. <clears throat> Super hipster. So we've actually replaced Paul with, I mean, with Gwildor. I mean, they look similar, too. We figured there wouldn't be much uh, discernible difference. Well, I saw people in the chat were just saying, like, Paul is Gwildor, Paul is Gwildor. It's just like, why are we settling for Paul when we can have the original? You know, we can That's have true. we can actually have Gwildor here. <clears throat> just leave that up, by the way. I'm fine with that. Because it'll deny that dude making the montage his picture, dude. He'll have to use Gwildor for one of the pictures. Oh, dude, you know, you now know she doesn't take that shit down, right? What? I didn't take nothing down. Oh, yeah, he's getting his finger ready to take it down. I am not. They... <laughs> he's going to take it down. I am not taking it down. Don't you worry. All right. Don't take it down, then. Whatever, what TJ. Don't you fret. Don't you frown. Ah! ah! He didn't get shit. He didn't get shit. He didn't get shit. He got nothing. <laughs> Quildo, the last dinosaur. He's my friend and a whole lot more. <laughs> uh, so, as you can see, our channel is able to live stream again. Yay! For those of you who uh, didn't um, see uh, the the last video, we had a strike on the channel for hate speech. Hate speech. Uh, totally bogus strike. We brought the case to YouTube. YouTube agreed that it was a bogus strike. And actually, uh, ideology strike was removed, yes. and so was I had like, it, the, life. at exactly the same time. Yeah. So someone at YouTube actually took a look at the case I was making and actually agreed with me. So that's cool. Which is shocking. That's like almost unprecedented in history. So that that calls for a celebration. Maybe it's because the nukes are coming. Hip, Everyone's hip, on the best behavior, you know. I'll brew a potion for the celebration. Hate speech is mean. It's a mean old thing. There you go. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> fuck you, and, TJ. And for the record, piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> this is my favorite DFF episode. Gildor loves the Jews, just for the record. He loves them. Why? He just does. Okay. There's no confusion at YouTube. He loves them. Everyone loves the Jews. Yeah, we yeah. love them. I mean, Gwildor kind of looks like he might be a Jew, you know? He probably is. I mean, Wait I'm, a, I'm a, a fucking Jew. That's a little bit anti-Semitic, too. How's that anti-Semitic? Oh, it's anti-Semitic for... You're saying some... Jewish people look like this? No, I'm just saying I think Gwildor might be Jewish. You're a fucking racist, TJ. Anyway, oh, that's not what I wanted to be at yet. Boom. We have uh, updated our Patreon, changed things around. You notice that it's no longer just the DFF Patreon. It is still the D it is still the DFF Patreon, but it's also so much more now. Um, you know, those of you who are already patrons, nothing has changed except you just get more. Yeah, we, we were, we, you know, TJ and Paul and I, we were talking about, it and we're like, why do we need three Patreons? We can just have one Patreon. It's just too confusing. There's too many different. You know, it's like which one are you gonna, uh, you know, support? And we're like, this doesn't make any sense. You kind of feel like double dipping, you know, we're like, let's just have one Patreon so everyone just who likes this content can go there. If there's some content they don't like, then they just don't have to watch it. If there's con but if they like it all, they get it all, you know? Yeah. So here's what you get. Paul wrote out this, this little uh, screed here. The buffet. He turned it into food. Hungry? You're a gluttonous little piggy, aren't you? So are we. That's why we created this tier. For starters, you get four or five. Private, deep fat fried episodes a month. Can you clean your plate? Not full yet? Well, don't worry. TJ Kirk will be delivering a hot steaming platter of abandoned hope, a private live show where degeneracy and debauchery are par for the course. How's about a movie and some popcorn for a change of pace? You'll also get a private episode of Cynics vs. Cinema every month 
where you'll get to join Paul and TJ as they watch and tear apart whatever they want. Still hungry for more? Of course you are. Strap yourself in for dessert. Paul, TJ, and occasionally, if you're lucky, Scotty will fill your face with some patrons-only ideology streams. Now, there've been, there's been some confusion about some aspects of this, so uh, let's just quickly address some of those. First of all, some people think that we're moving ideology to a patrons-only thing. No. No. We're simply, do, we're simply going to do a couple of patrons-only ideologies here and there. Little extra nuggets of ideology for patrons only, but we're going to keep doing yes ideologies as normal. The and it'll be free. The Friday shows of DFF go behind the paywall like always. You'll just be getting also the Cinema versus Cynics thing, the Abandoned Hope, and uh, some ideologies that are open only to these patrons. We're probably going to get you guys a Discord at some point. We haven't developed that yet. Um, it's in the wakes. In the wakes. Um, it's all under the banner of Pessimist Productions. If you support this, this is a combined Patreon for Deep Fat Fried and the TJ Kirk channel and Cynic, the Cinema for Cynics and Hideology and all of our ventures combined. Um, so you support this, you're basically supporting the three of us in all of our endeavors under one umbrella Patreon with one simple tier. Uh, and, because and simplicity he, for us is the name of the game. Not only simplicity, but like, the insane value dude five bucks for like anywhere from 12 to like 15 hours of content a month yes and uh also we're currently at 1993 patrons Only seven more until seven more until we get we have to do a 12 hour show and remember our patrons are still this month getting a um a drunken prohibition themed show where we're gonna drink literal actual moonshine Yep. While we attempt to do a show about prohibition yes. and fail miserably, and it'll just get into a, worse and it's going to be a fist fight by the end of it, probably. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, and you can look forward to that this month and next month. We're going to be doing for a everybody of perks, patrons or not. You're going to get the 12 hour show, but um, that's just to celebrate the success of Deep Fat Fried. Um, like I said, we're, at, we're actually at, uh, we actually got one patron since we started doing this. 1,994 patrons now, so we are only a scant six patrons away from doing the 12-hour show next month. I think there's very little doubt that we will be doing that show. Dude, I th I think we can make it by the end of this show, dude. I think we can make it by the end of this show. Oh, I think you're probably right. We'll see. 2,000 patrons by the end of this show. 12-hour so, uh, show next month. If you want to go check it out, it's still a DFF podcast uh, URL, the same one that's down below. Check it out and uh, read more Learn more about what our Patreon is all about and what it's supporting. And uh, if, you, if it sounds good to you, uh, you know, become a patron. Yeah. So today's episode... All right, I'm taking this down, Paul. What? Today's Why? episode... All right, fine. Yeah. Today's episode is about the nukes. The nukes. The nukes. The nukes. The nukes. Yes. So should we now, just... Paul, you were a lead researcher... D TJ, should we just get up and just let Paul have this episode? Just be like, look, Paul can probably talk about this shit for like several hours. I can right? just preach my... Well, you know, before we even get into any sort of history or anything, Paul. last time we did this, this was fun, so I figured we'd take another look over at the nuke map. Oh, yeah. Nuke map. Because last time we had... destroy your city. We had a lot of fun with that last time. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't have a lot of fun with it again here. Um, so uh, the nuke map, for those of you who don't know, you could choose a, um, you know, you could choose a bomb, you could choose a target. Um, you know, we, we only did U.S. cities. Do they have like London or something we could do? We could do London. Let's see what I'm happens. Sure. To, let's see what happens to London. I'm sure it's one of the presets. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a big ass fucking city. Yeah, there let's it is see. right there. London, London England. London, England. Yeah, so, so you British, London. you limey fucks. Let's see what happens to you motherfuckers when this shit goes down. Let's see. Davy Crockett, the smallest U.S. bomb produced. All right. This is the smallest bomb. Smallest. So this is the smallest of the small bombs. Oh, shit. I mean, it blew up the whole bridge. Lon yeah, London Bridge is definitely falling fucking down. Lambeth Bridge might be okay. Big Ben is gone. Big Ben's fucking demolished, dude. What about like a medium sized one? All right, let's let's up the kiloton. Yeah, because this is like the uh, this isn't even a kiloton. So let's see. This is Fat Man. This is the Nagasaki bomb. Twenty kiloton. Oh shit, dude. Oops. 
Oh, you in trouble now, London. Yeah, London is fucked. What's the gray area there? The gray area is... Uh, okay, that's air blast radius. That's... Okay, yeah, the air blast, air blast radius. radius. That's like, yeah. bro- like broken windows and shit. Right. Or just like blown buildings completely apart. I think the air blast from these can like knock buildings over and shit. Yeah, this is the thermal radiation radius. This is the air blast. I don't know what's the difference between these two air blasts. Oh, this is just different levels of the air blast radius. Oh, okay. So this is the one that would knock over buildings. Got it. So five. This is the one that's just going to like blow out windows and shit. Um,. Air blast. This is the air blast radius that's just going to totally destroy everything in its path. And the and center that's is the like, fireball. Yeah, that that's just like total destruction. Well, that's I mean, just what's going to be totally incinerated. Drop the biggest nuke ever on London. All right. What's the biggest fucking nuke, dude? There it is. I, so. it's like the I, I don't think this was one. ever actually built, but it was designed. No, no, it was built. It was built and exploded. No, this one was. Oh, okay. This one was because these are both SAR bombas. This one is the one, this one they designed. This is the largest one tested. Got it. So here's the largest one they tested. Here's what it does. <laughs> oh no, dude. Yeah, London's just fucked. There's no London anymore. There is. Yeah, London's over. Oxford's okay. London's fucked. <laughs> Watford is fucked. Slough is fucked. Bracknell is fucked. Oh, not you're, Slough, dude. You're gonna get angry, fucking British people tomorrow, dude. You didn't pronounce it right. Pronounce the name right. Basil Don. That's oh, fucked. how dare you call it Chelmsford? Oh no, dude. Slough, dude. Totally fucked. The angry I'm, fucking. The angry fucking letters are. Harlow is fucked, dude. Of all, dude, they these... have a place called Stevenage. Stevenage. Cool. <laughs> what a of all of these little fucking suburbs of London, I weep for Slough the hardest. Me, Slough. me too, dude. Slough is a good one. Let's see what the largest bomb ever uh, designed would do. Most of the Isle oh, of shit, <laughs> the main Isle of Britain is fucking gone. Holy shit! Awesome. No, that's just a huge chunk of like. Dude, I mean, think about how many millions look, of people live in that. We should fucking look at circle. Tokyo if we can do that one, dude. The all city right. that fucking. Like the only country to actually experience this shit firsthand. So that's how much of Japan would just be destroyed. Well, Tokyo didn't, but... Well, no, Tokyo is uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I know that. There you go. Oh, fuck, dude. Uh, fuck their shit up. That's the largest one ever. Let's see what that largest one that's ever actually been detonated would do. Still, oh, yeah. Still all pretty Tokyo fucking is significant. Gone. Tokyo is just gone as a city. I mean, like, you, you see how, like few of these that you need to just knock out every major population center basically because like that's an overkill there you why would they explode a bomb that big there you know what i mean if you wanted to completely cripple tokyo you could probably do it with less than half of that oh yeah i mean you could do it with uh, oh yeah if you launch like 30 to 40 nukes i mean you can take out most of the vital infrastructure in asia and you know europe and the u.s just hit them with the nagasaki bomb again sorry japan Fuck, dude. They just can't. They can't fucking catch a break. I mean, that'd probably fuck their shit up pretty bad. I mean, if they dropped everyone it right, in this circle is dead. If they, well, they dropped it right in downtown. It would just absolutely cripple the city. Dude, you know, you know what they should do? They should make a fucking uh, movie about the U.S. dropping a bomb, but they also create a fucking tsunami bomb, dude. So they fucking nuked fucking Tokyo. Tsubami. And su- uh, the tsunami fucking drops. And it's like, whoosh, the tsunami. <laughs> the tsunami. And they oh, just fucking God. devastate fucking Japan again, dude. It's like you know what? You guys All have right, been who, through this shit twice. Is someone like tapping their foot? over and over again i am okay i'm just wondering <coughs> uh anyway well, I'm, I, I'm getting a fucking boner thinking about these fucking oh that's a blow oh, god tokyo destroyed oh uh, let it go uh, you know how it goes so let's take a look at the Lava schematics of one of these fucking bombs eh? dude can we show this uh, i guess dude I mean, what if one of our people like all right. Just builds a bomb now because we showed him how to well, do it. Well, this isn't step-by-step guides how to build a bomb. It's Dude, just... I could probably build one just looking at this. <laughs> Boom. I just go get I get a thistle oh, pit. Yeah. I put it in the tamper. That's that's all you got to do, huh? Yeah. Well, look. Just go down to the next one. Yeah. You get the thistle pit. All right. So here's what the... I would recommend starting at ballistic casing. So the thistle build from the pit inside apparently out. is uh, the pit. The pit. Oh, shit. <laughs> the pit. Oh, shit. <laughs> 
Whoa. What a great explanation. A uh, pit of shit. So there's actually just a core made of sh- solid shit. <laughs> the pit, the fissile fill. The fissile pit. TJ. It's a material uh, core of the atomic bomb, the special nuclear fuel that undergoes the nuclear fission chain reaction. Generally, they are composed of either plutonium 239 or uranium 235. Are you guys writing this down? Yeah, well, they usually have that at Home Depot, yeah? Though, yeah. Though a few other uh, select isotopes can be used as a bomb fuel. In the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki, a 6.2 kilogram plutonium-239 pit powered the reaction uh, that released the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT. Ooh. In more sophisticated designs, an even smaller mass of material can be used in a bomb. So the, the the thing that actually explodes is really fucking small. Right. It's tiny. Well, I mean, atoms are tiny themselves, yeah. and they're the one causing the uh, the release of energy. It's just amazing how much energy yeah. is contained in a fucking the atom. The children of Adam. Uh, so then the tamper is the, the heavy fucking uh, sphere around it to keep it fucking... Contained while know, it's not yeah. exploding. Yeah, you know, to make sure it doesn't... Just blow up. It apparently improves the efficiency of the chain reaction and shit. Then there's another fucking ball around that. A uh, pusher. A, a, a sphere of light material that surrounds the pit. The pusher of the Fat Man bomb was made of aluminum. 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 Its role was to help smooth out the implosion blast wave as it made its way towards the pit, increasing the efficiency and symmetry of pit compression. Cool. Uh, the explosive lens, lenses, sorry, uh, are conventional high explosives whose simultaneous explosion creates the implosion blast wave that ultimately compresses the pit to several times its original density, starting the chain reaction. So they actually have conventional explosives that explode inward to crush the nuclear material, and that's what yep. creates the explosion. Yep. Interesting. Uh, fusing and firing. Um, it's a configuration that's used to send an electrical signal to each of the explosive lenses with high precision uh, simultaneity. Simultaneity? Is that spelled? Uh, in the Fat Man bomb, it consisted of altitude-detecting switches that calculated the position of the bomb, electrical switches that would send the firing... So, so this is basically just the system that tells it when to explode. Right. And then the ballistic casing, which is just the housing of the bomb. Um pretty cool i'm gonna go build one yeah it seems pretty simple like i didn't know it was that easy like why doesn't everybody have one of these i mean you the usa figured this shit out i mean just just a small matter of getting the uranium or the plutonium you know just that that's the little rub but i'll get it i can get you some fucking uranium dude yeah you want some fucking uranium dude yeah i'll have some uranium here by fucking 10 o'clock tonight dude no problem cool. no fucking problem you want it refined or unrefined uh well, yeah. obviously refined okay I mean, well on. i'm just asking i'm a refined gentleman i want refined i mean i've got a i've got a uranium refiner up in my room i just didn't know if you you had one oh, of those. I mean, you know paul i mean this is just kind of ridiculous you know i like dude. that you know unrefined what? uranium you know what i mean oh I like you're to, a purist I like, huh well i like to do the refining myself you know what I mean? So I hope all you people in the chat were jotting that down. Yep. They're all taking notes. A bunch what? of sociopaths out there in the chat. Mm. By the way, the, no, no, nothing that I say tonight can come back to me because I'm, I'm Gwildor tonight. Gwildor! So I can be as, as toxic as I want to be tonight. And nobody can blame me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Your, your toxic masculinity is just fucking taking over the show. Gwildor. Yep. Nuke North Korea. Hashtag nuke North Korea is in our... Um, Whoa. Are they're 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 ramping oh, up for war down there? Well, go back to the go back to the map and and do it for them real quick if oh, they yeah. want it so right. bad. Yeah, that's that's fair. Let's nuke North Korea. North Korea. Nuke Pyongyang, dude. Pyongyang, Pyongyang. Fuck you, Pyongyang. You piece of shit. Kim Jong Un is gonna fucking pay, dude. Dude, his fat little ass is gonna roast like a rasher of bacon, dude. Just a rasher. A rasher of bacon, Paul? Yeah, a rasher of bacon. Whoa, dude. Paul. That seems like awfully British of you to say, dude. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name's not Paul. Were, I thought you I'm were... Gwildor, the magical British fairy oh, scientist. Oh, you're fucking British, dude? We thought you were American. <laughs> you said I, I thought you thought I was a Jew. Boom. Fuck you, What's well, American Pyongyang. Jews? Oh, nobody can see it, TJ. Piece of shit. You're the only one, you're the only one getting to oh, see. Oh, no, dude. It's Glenn ah, fucking it's up fine. again. Here we go. Pyongyang is destroyed. Oh, damn, dude. What about, what about uh, Seoul? Seoul? All right. 
It's not that far. It should be south. I don't think I can just... Maybe I can. I can just drag can you, it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I can just drag it. What's well, it south? Oh, yeah, dude. Sorry. Why are you going so, north? South Korea. South Korea, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, South Korea, TJ. So here we go. Oh, damn it. Drag, bitch. There we go. Still right there. Damn, dude. They're kind of... They're pretty close to one another. They could... I mean, like, if that was dropped, that'd fuck up a little bit of North Korea. Was that the biggest one? That's the big... Well, that's the biggest one ever tested. Oh, uh, okay. So, we damn. Could, they could do something a little bit, you know... A little more targeted. Ivy King or whatever the fuck. You know. A couple of those just... Yeah, just, you know, gone. a few of those in the hillside. Pew, pew, pew. You know, little little targeted strike. I don't there. know why you'd hit the hillside, though. I mean... I mean, there's people living up in there. Not as many as people living in the fucking city. Look, there's... Look at all this shit. Only so many people can live. Yeah, but why fucking... would you want the epicenter to be the fucking yeah. hillside? Let's hit the mountainous region right well, next th- to I'm the city. I'm saying, like, you know, you shoot, you shoot a few of them. I mean, why wouldn't you? Just pew, pew, pew. Oh, you mean hit fucking all the? Wait, you hit... I'm talking about like a bunch of these all scattered around this fucking. Area. Well, I mean, some of the uh, the U.S. missile sites are in the middle of nowhere, like fucking Kansas and shit. So, I mean, they probably got missile shit somewhere in there. Miss, miss, missile shit. Missile shit. They got, like, fucking missile shit, you know? Missile shit. That's how the military works. They're like, get us the missile shit immediately. I wasn't aware I was supposed to be Ted Koppel. I thought we were just a bunch of stoners talking about this shit. You know what, TJ? (laughs) I actually did expect you to be Ted Koppel, so, no, I'm kind of disappointed. First things first, we're going to set up a perimeter. Get some missile shit up in those hills. (laughs) Get some missile shit. We need missile shit now. Missile shit. (laughs) Get some missile shit up in them hell now. Get it. Get Get a missile shit up in in the hell, boy. (sighs) Silos, I don't know. Silos, that's correct. You'd be the subject of like a Ken Burns documentary 20 years after your battle. The most resounding failure of any <laughs> commander ever in human history. Put some missile shit up in those hills, TJ Kirk. Uh, TJ's first command was to, quote, put missile shit up in them hills immediately, <laughs> you motherfuckers. Let's get some missile shit up in now. While I smoke a fatty and chill. I sound like a pretty awesome general, dude. I don't know. I think I would lead the people to victory. I think you would fucking lead them to Waterloo, TJ. You're fucking Napoleon. Nuke Detroit. Oh, wait, we already did that. <laughs> no, but, yeah, but there's no point of nuking Detroit. You'd just be like, if they nuked it, it'd be like, what changed? Detroit stayed the same. We, oh, yeah, we could nuke Festus. That might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> you won't even need a big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, use a little fucking but I mean, small one. But I mean, if it's in Missouri, why wouldn't you want to use a big one? Yeah. Scorched earth, dude. Salt the fucking lands. Nuke the lands. All right, I'm going to show you guys. Let's see. This is just a little one here. Festus is the bestest. Devastation. Yeah. Festus is Festus gone. no longer exists. That's just... A, that's not even... A, you know, that's just like a fuck. That's just the uh, Ivy King. I guess it's a that's largest. A, it, I guess that's pretty it's a large big one. one. Let's see what this one would do. Yeah. Boom. Oh, that gets that fucking hits St. Louis even. Yeah. St. Most of St. Louis is gone now, too. Fuck that. Let's see if we can get all of St. Louis. Yep. Yeah. Fuck you, St. Louis. <laughs> You're fucking done, bitch. Gorn. En- we've had enough of your bullshit. I think it might be overkill, but, you know. I mean, is that really true in in Missouri, though? Can you kill too many why Missourians? Do you, why do you have such a prejudice against Missourians, dude? I don't, I don't really why don't you? I don't know. That's just a good question. I never thought I about that. Fucking, my uncle lives in St. Louis. That's why, dude. Well, he's not a Missourian. I mean, he technically is. He has lived there for fucking over 20 years. Whatever. Stop nuking his family. We'll, situation. we'll get we'll get him out by helicopter or whatever. All right, well that's fine then. This is a bit dull. I'm here for Paul. Well, Paul's not even here tonight. I'm here for Paul. It's Gwildor tonight. It's too bad, bitch boy. Complain all you like, but Gwildor is here for the chat. Requested him. Press seven to nuke Scotty. All right, cool. Now they're saying they want man. These our chat is getting fucking nuke crazy, dude. I know, dude. This is you know they this... want to nuke shit. They want to nuke me. They want to nuke Scott. I'm gonna nuke, nuke your you. fucking face tonight. Give me some to nuke. Damn, damn. T- a timely parody. <laughs> See, dude, we all think that Trump is a disastrous president, but just don't ever put Scotty in there, dude. That he'll be like, give me something to nuke immediately, dude. Me and fucking Fred, vice president Fred, Fred Durst. Durst yeah, dude. dude. Give me something to nuke. Give me tonight. something to fucking nuke. 
All right, so uh, this is a little summary of the Manhattan Project. Uh, what's that, dude? I don't even know, dude. You don't. You really Paul's, don't. Paul's you don't gonna know. Tell you, man. I was just fucking with you. You don't really don't. Yeah, know you really. Don't I don't know. know nothing, man. She has an I don't ignorant know fuck, shit. dude. Well, avail yourself. That's TJ. what I'm. I thought I was here to learn, dude. Well, you are. Early in 1939, the world's scientific community. Um, I can't read that. Discovered the German physicists had learned the secrets of splitting a, a uranium atom. Urania? I was, I, yep. Fears soon spread over the possibility of Nazi scientists utilizing that energy to produce a bomb capable of unspeakable destruction. Sounds cool. So, like, the entire, the nuclear bomb exists basically because we were afraid that the Such Nazis humans. were going to get it first. So, scientist Albert Einstein, who fled Nazi persecution, and Enrico Fermi, who escaped fascist Italy... We're now living in the, U- the U.S. They agreed that, uh, that the president must be informed of the dangers of atomic technology in the hands of the Axis powers. So, yeah, so basically Einstein and Fermi convinced the United States that it was probably, that Germany was probably going to be able to do the, this and that we needed to do it first. The funny thing, though, was that, like, the, U- the U- U.S. political fucking, like, the governance, like, the president and people were kind of just like, meh, you know, like, initially kind of like, what is this? You know, it's kind of like, you know, back in the 90s and people talked about the internet, like, the internet will transform the world and people are like, got a bunch of hocus pocus bullshit. It don't matter to me. But I mean, that, that, but then they, then they had started having breakthroughs with this and realizing like, oh, wait, this can be weaponized, which, of course, that's how shit gets done in America. It's like the space race. It was like the Russians are gonna go and they're gonna take over the world. It's like, oh shit, we better build some shit. And, and it was just like conveying the idea to people seemed to be the problem. And the reading that I did about this was like, in those days, trying to explain to people something that one thing that was that destructive was hard to get across because you know people kind of knew bombs were capable of doing only so much damage. You had to drop a bunch of them on a target to to do any significant infrastructural people. damage. And then you're talking about one device that could level a city, and you're trying to impress that upon people who have never seen or heard of anything well, like it. I mean, ostensibly, you had people born that had... I mean, a time before cars were commonplace, before a lot of technological shit was just coming about. So, I mean, 1939, people were not as educated about this stuff, so they're just like kind of like... Like I said, it's like the, it was like the internet 30 years ago. I was like, what is it? You know, it was just tr- starting to get into the cultural consciousness, and people were just starting to kind of grasp what it was. Well... Yeah, so these scientists um, basically, um, let's see, where, where where did we leave off? Right around here. Oh, Got it. So President up. Roosevelt um, agreed to proceed slowly. In late 1941, the American effort to design and build an atomic bomb received its code name, the Manhattan Project. Um, so there were a few universities where the research was conducted, Um we have a little something on the first nuclear chain reaction. Maybe you can uh, bring that up now, because that was really the first experiment that proved that. The, the, is it the Trinity atomic test? No. Which one is it? There should be one about like a, like a whole article about nuclear chain react. The first, yeah. Yep. There we go. Oh, I thought it was a. I thought yeah, you wanted scroll to down a little bit. All right. Go to harnessing fission. Yeah. So as part of the Manhattan Project effort to build an atomic bomb during World War II, Slizzard worked together with physicists. Wait a minute. Slizzard. Slizzard dude? Yeah, Slizzard, dude. Dude, I, what the fuck? I'm probably saying that wrong. No, nah, that looks right. Slizzard? Dude, that sounds like a Bond villain. Slizzard. <laughs> yeah. Worked together with a physicist Enrico Fermi and other colleague, colleagues at the University of Chicago to create the, the world's first experimental nuke. Look at this fucking thing. Scroll down. It's basically a bunch of fucking bricks in a basement. <laughs> That's Under, crazy. Yeah. Um, so the first nuclear... Uh, cha- scroll back up a little bit, because I think they kind of describe where this was. Um, oh, shit. Let's see. Nice, Scotty. To make sure they could safely control the chain reaction, the team rigged together what they called control rods. These were simply sheets of the element cadmium an excellent neutron absorber. Whatever. You can just see... I just really thought that like this picture of the first experimental yeah, like, nuclear reactors. Yo, we building a, a nuclear reactor in the basement of the college. Let's right. get some bricks together. Uh, well, what the fuck were they supposed to build it, TJ? Dude, I don't know. It just looks like something that, like, you know, you just hire a couple contractors to come put in or something. You know? 
you just you you think of a nuclear reactor as being this like super advanced technology, and obviously, well, it at, is at, at this one point, point there was it wasn't like that. There was there, I mean, there was actually a cutting edge at what one point, teacher, where they they hadn't figured all this shit out. Well, yeah, it's kind of how fucking science works, you uneducated fucking twit. Go there and slap you, TJ. So slap some fucking sense into you. What's your problem, Scotty? Problem is you're a fucking piece of shit, TJ. Doesn't fucking appreciate science. And what's done for the fucking world, buddy. Yeah, it gave us the bomb. It gave us a lot more than that, TJ. The bomb. Clean, sustainable energy. So once they proved that you could do this nuclear chain reaction thing, then then it was a matter of proving proving that you could turn that into a bomb. And that's the test footage there, TJ. The Trinity. The Trinity ex- uh, tests were the right. kind of proof of concept. Let's take a for look. For atomic dun, weapons. Dun, dun. The yeah. The three films are complete rolls from the Trinity Dude, test. On, on my July fucking 16th. birthday. On my fucking birthday, July 16th. Obviously, I wasn't born at this point. This footage is silent. I wish most of the footage that I could find of these was silent because most people, you know, have, f- feel the need to put Flight of the Valkyries over it or some shit. Dun, 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 it's dun, in metric. Dun, dun. So 9,000 meters away, this is what it looks like. I mean, it just doesn't stop. And this is the first, you know, the, these are the first nuclear devices ever tested. Eight. This is from Adam Central. There's, um,. There's a, a lot of these. Uh, they get closer and closer, I think. 35 yeah, f- millimeter uh, distance from ground. The same. Yep. Just a different angle. Whoa. Whoa, what the fuck, dude? I wish there was some stuff in there for scale. Banana for scale. I mean, you you, you got to give them... They weren't working with the greatest camera technology here. Which is kind of crazy. The power they're unleashing, but the camera's kind of like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, think about so how much camera technology... So a, big, a, big, a bigger then. lens, 610 millimeter lens. I don't even really understand what I'm seeing here. Yeah, it's, this one's hard to tell. Just like the sky around it or something? Yeah, maybe it's pointed up from the ground up. Oh, to kind of get a yeah, to get vantage a, point of what's going on up there. It's yeah, the that's, other that looks exactly really like what it is. So that's a cloud there. And this is just a ground up view of the entire sky being consumed by a fucking giant nuclear fireball. Holy shit. Can you imagine how people felt the first time they watched one of these go off? Can you imagine being at the, like this first test and being one of the first human beings to lay their eyes on this kind of destruction? Well, the first test, like I think they said, they, this broke windows a hundred miles away. It's I mean, the devastating power of this. I mean, I don't think people fully comprehended it. Even the scientists working on it were kind of like, "What's going to happen?" I mean, they didn't really know what was going to happen. I mean, it was theorized it could actually destroy every, like, destroy the planet. Whoa. Okay. Uh, that was a short episode. It's over. Yeah, there were scientists that feared that it could, like, it would consume the stratosphere. Yep. The entire atmosphere um, was just going to be destroyed. There were scientists that posited that it was, po- that, you know, once the chain reaction started, that it wouldn't stop until it couldn't find any more matter to consume. Um, you know what Some I mean? Some terrifying thoughts, really. And, but we and, still did it. And really, like, you know, those were pretty plausible hypotheses, but we did it anyway because we were afraid that if we didn't, somebody else would first. The Nazis will do it. Whoa. Whoa, what the fuck, dude? Scotty's an orc from Lord of the Rings? <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. Cool. There we go. Sweet. Fuck you, TJ! <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. What have you done to me, TJ? Take me off the show immediately. By the numbers, World War II's atomic bombs. So, yeah, we developed them and then uh, almost immediately found targets so for them. Here's just a quick little uh, series of numbers. I mean, like, obviously, if you build the bomb, you got to so figure out somewhere two, to drop it. Yep. I mean, of course. So, n- two, number of atomic bombs dropped on Japan during World War II. Well, the pretty o- much everyone knows that. Yep. The only ones ever used in, in combat, right? You know, yep. There's never been yep. another nuclear strike on an I, enemy. I think you would have heard about it if it had yeah. happened. <laughs> 
That's the only two. I'm pretty so sure. Eighty thousand people. That's the number who died instantly. Instantly. Yeah, instantly in Hiroshima, uh, Japan. So not even Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's, just that, that was just, just Hiroshima. One. Yeah. Um, one hundred ninety-two thousand and twenty. The total number killed in Hiroshima, combining those killed instantly with those killed from radiation and other aftermath. Uh, three, the number of days between the first and second atomic bomb dropped on Japan. On August 9th, 1945, an implosion model plutonium uh, bomb codenamed Fat Man was detonated well, over the, Nagasaki. The interesting the reason why they did this, too, I mean, one, I think, yeah, part, it was partially because, like, let's see what this can do. But they also expected to have about a million plus casualties fighting through the, main, the mainland of Japan. So it was kind of like, we have this option, which is drop this bomb and just kill a shit ton of Japanese people, and hopefully uh, they'll realize they have no chance against us, which actually did which work. Which is what happened. I mean, which it actually did work. Think, think, just think about, like, th those numbers are pretty staggering to me. 192,000 people yep. basically just evaporated with one weapon. Well, that was including the fallout and other stuff. Well, that's yeah. what I'm saying. But yeah, I mean, for all intents and purposes, they're gone. Right, it might have taken a few days for them to die, sure. or they were killed not by the bomb itself, but by a building falling over on them, or well, some shit. Yeah. Whatever it was, yeah, the devastation. Sickness. If my memory serves me, the only structure standing in Hiroshima was like this dome thing. Like everything else had just been leveled. I mean, people etched into the fucking the, the pavement, and the sidewalks, and shit. Like everyone, like if you were near the epicenter, it was just like I mean, it was just done. For, for for context, America is vastly. I don't need to say. I mean, obviously, it's vastly larger than Japan oh, is. Yeah. Look how apoplectic we got on 9-11 when 3,000 people died. Yeah, Think so, about 192,000 people from one attack, and then a second one goes off in another city. It says right here, uh, more Keep, than 70,000 killed instantly in Nagasaki. And there were people that survived both attacks, surprisingly. Five, that's the number of days after the bombing of Nagasaki Saki, that the Emperor Hirohito announced Japan's acceptance of... Yeah, the America wins! ...of the post dam declaration and its unconditional Hey, TJ, what country won? USA! America USA. won! USA! Number, uh, so two, number of possible targets for the second bombing, Nagasaki and Kukuru, Kukura. Nagasaki was chosen because of the weather. Okay. Damn, dude, dude, think about the people that lived in Kokura, dude. They were they woke up that day and they were like, ah, oh, shitty day. It's raining and storming. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Saved their fucking asses that day. <laughs> yeah. Two billion Nagasaki dollars. Nagasaki people woke up and they were like, oh, what a beautiful sunny day. Not a cloud in the sky. Apparently it took $2 billion. I don't know if that's adjusted for inflation or not to research no, and develop believe it is. the Manhattan Project. 130,000, the number of people employed by the Manhattan Project. Three, the number of research laboratories involved in the development of the bombs. 17, uh, that's the physicists working on the Manhattan Project who already were or later would later become Nobel laureates in physics. So not just 17 physicists, no, 17, 17 Nobel physicists laureates. that went to become Nobel laureates. Yeah. Um, 18,000. Tons of TNT equaled by the blast from New Mexico for the New Mexico test on July 16th that we watched earlier. Right. Um, 1,800 uh, feet, the distance above ground that little boy detonated over Hiroshima after it was released. So that's an interesting thing about these two. They don't, act, the bomb never act, doesn't hit the ground and explode there. No. Because that's a waste of its energy. It, it blows up a little bit above the city and then the explosion hits the city downward well that's why they had the altimeter on those bombs was it, they wanted to drop it at a certain height uh, 9700 pounds is the weight of the uh, little, boy little boy atomic bomb most of that's just like the housing of it and shit yeah. right yeah. 60,000 feet is the height of the mushroom cloud following the detonation of fat man over nagasaki so that's just some cool little I, I believe statistics. They, yeah, 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 they're talking about the Enola Gay. I believe they actually did uh, take uh, like video footage of the uh, the attacks too. So the um, the uh, one of the key developers of the atomic bomb, uh, Robert Oppenheimer. Oh. Oppenheimer. We have him uh, doing his little. He was kind of, he was pretty shook by what he what he'd done, oh, what yeah. he'd been part of. Yeah, he's he, that's what he's talking about here. He's uh, uh, giving a, a speech about what it was like at the Los Alamos laboratory as the reports of the devastation in Hiroshima came in. He knew the world would not be the same. Two people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is 
trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says now I am become death the destroyer of worlds I suppose we all thought that one way or another that's pretty neat <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, fa- the famous quote We've all, you know, everybody has seen a billion, you know, videos of these bombs going off. But you have to understand, like, put yourself in the mindset of not even conceiving of something that destructive and then watching it happen. I mean, prior to that, the only thing that was really that really had that destructive power in people's minds was like God. God, yeah. You know, because I mean, that that was like one of God's big things is like God can level your whole city at once. Yeah, God can smite you. He can judge you. He can be like... Oh, you guys are fornicators and, and sinners. Boom, you're destroyed. That was a power attributed to God. So, you know, in the uh, 20th century, it's all of a sudden, okay, well, actually, human beings can do this, too. We can just level yeah. cities. We can we have this destructive power. That's why he quoted that. He was, you know, that's the he, he was looking at something that he had created that had done something that, you know, you would attribute to a God. The just destruction, the, the entire destruction of a city. You know, that's a biblical thing. That's something you read about in the Bible. God smote this city or that city. Now we can smite a city. Well, then it becomes real, too. I mean, before it was just testing in the middle of the fucking desert in New Mexico, and now it's suddenly, let's drop on a city. There are lives. Yeah. Yeah, Let's drop on a city and see what happens. 80,000 people incinerated in a second. Just and, and to know you're kind of, and, I mean, you really are responsible for that. I mean, that's that weighs heavy on anyone's conscience. So do you have that shit that I pulled that was just in the document there? Uh, yeah, because um, that's an interesting thing. After the bomb went off, there was a really interesting uh, extra- exchange between Oppenheimer and uh, Harry Truman, the president. Oh, yeah. So sensing a lack of urgency in the U.S. president, uh, well, Harry it's, Truman. It, urgency, it's talking about um, in like limiting the scope of these weapons and trying to control other people from getting them and shit. Uh, and feeling, uh, perhaps feeling a little overwhelmed by their first meeting. Oppenheimer confided, Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. The remark infuriated Truman, who bluntly replied, as he later told David Lilenthal, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, that the blood is on my hands, let me worry about that. Smoothly ejected the physicist uh, and instructed Secretary of State Dean Aikson Uh, never to bring that son of a bitch in this office ever again. Oppenheimer meant that he wore the blood of future casualties of the nuclear war, not the blood of the Japanese. The crybaby scientist as... See, this is just proof that we've always had some stupid fucking presidents. Oh, yeah. He's a crybaby. It's like... That is fucking cry... Get this fucking crybaby out of here trying to warn me. He helped create a weapon that could unleash the the entire destruction of humanity. And then was trying, in retrospect, to make sure that, you know, the, the use of these weapons was controlled and the proliferation of them was controlled. He was trying to warn the president that... What was going to happen could happen. This this arms race where bigger and bigger bombs were built, and Which Harry happened. Truman called him a fucking crybaby. Which Oppenheimer's remarks alluded to the responsibility, to his responsibility for the deaths of millions of individuals in some distant apocalypse which would be traced to the two nuclear bombs nicknamed Little Boy and Fat Man. Hiroshima and Nagasaki served as terrible, if necessary, examples of what the bomb might do. He did not think of them as avoidable tragedies in their own right. He quickly cast forward as though he dared not look back to a world where he dreamed global controls on nuclear weapons would entrench a lasting peace. So Oppenheimer was basically trying to warn Truman... You know, these are going to, this is, you know, this is, you don't realize how much of a game changer this shit really is. Right. This is going to fuck shit up real bad. And Truman didn't listen. Called him a crybaby and said, never let that motherfucker in my office again. Was kind of drunk with the idea of the new power that the American military wielded. And, you know, as we'll see, as we go along down the story of this bomb, what Oppenheimer was warning him against came to pass. Oh, yeah. Completely. In a, in a huge way. Um... These are more by the number stuff. Uh, 240,000, that was the population of Nagasaki before the bombing. 
Uh, 74,000 estimated death toll included those who died from radiation-related injuries through December 31st, 1945. Um, population in Nagasaki today is uh, back up. Yeah, it's higher than it was. Uh, I mean, but those are also a baby boom in Japan in the 60s. Oh, as sure. Well. 31,500 height and feet from which the B-29 bombed the Fat Man bomb. Uh, that's the, we already, that's where it exploded. Yeah. So a, th- a thousand meter, a, th- a thousand meters above the ground. Well, 500 meters. Yeah. Uh, 70% of Nagasaki was destroyed. Oh, only that's 70%. 70%. And that's one fucking, this is one bomb. One device. One bomb. I mean, I mean, if there was two bombs or three bombs. That's not even very powerful by today's standards. Yeah. I and mean, we're talking one of these new bombs that went off in the city. It'd just be gone. It'd just, not just be Not even a, close. It'd be 435,000 uh, killed. That's what it would be. Oh, yeah, easily, oh, easily. Way more than that if that, that Sar Bomba shit was dropped. Oh, yeah, in the oh then it'd just Japan. be everybody. Yeah, pretty Every, much. Everyone in that radius, that, in the blast radius. So we got a few more, uh, like, the, the, it was kind of the, uh, the Soviet Union and America that entered into an arms race over this shit. Yeah, largely due to espionage on the, the uh, USSR's part. Uh, they were able to glom together enough uh, blueprints and bullshit to make their own bomb, and then it then it then it was on. At oh, that yeah, they, point, well, it was on. They actually infiltrated the Manhattan so, Project. Let me just uh, let me just show you guys some fucking uh, footage of various bomb tests going back and forth. So this is uh, the Ivy Mike detonation. What can you tell me about this, Paul? Uh, this is the first. Okay, so the the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were atomic bombs in the truest sense. And Truman immediately started work on uh, the hydrogen bomb, which is a vastly more powerful version oh, yeah. of a traditional nuclear. It's a thermonuclear device. So is this the So this first... is the first test, the first hydrogen bomb ever detonated on the face of the planet. Let's take a look. You have a grandstand seat here to one of the most momentous events in the history of science. In less than a minute, you will see the most powerful explosion ever witnessed by human eyes. The blast will come out of the horizon just about there. And this is the significance of the moment. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. For the sake of all of us, and for the sake of our country, I know that you join me in wishing this expedition well. It is now 30 (laughs) seconds to zero time. Put on goggles or turn away. Do not remove goggles or face burst until 10 seconds after the first light. (coughs) So a lot of this is just propaganda shit that was filmed after the fact. None of these people were actually present. Roger that. This is just their little propaganda movie they used to surround. I hope the device is successful. Behold the awe-inspiring power of the American Empire. Glory to America. Minus ten seconds. Niner, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, T-Zero. Cool. I love the way that like this sh- that this dome appears and then just oh that's so fucking amazing. So the existence of this film was basically to show the Russians like look what we can do motherfuckers. Don't fuck with us we been, Russia. We ain't been resting on our fucking laurels since we dropped them bombs on Japan, okay? We've been working on this shit, bitches. You don't want to fuck yeah, with us. Imagine this in Moscow. First full-scale H-bomb, 10 megatons. Neat. Packs a, packs a little bit of a punch. Take that, Russia, you fucks. Witness American might at its finest. So Paul just creamed in his pants. What what basically followed this was a series of like dick measuring contests between the United States and the USSR to see who could create the most impressively huge 
insanely destructive explosion. You know, the U.S. was like, oh, yeah, Russia. Well, we just blew up an entire fucking island in the South Pacific. And they were like, oh, yeah, capitalist pig dog. Well, we created bomb that would incinerate the entire city. And they're like, oh, yeah. Well, we created a bomb to blow up the fucking moon, bitch. How you like me now? And they were like, that is nothing. We created bomb that destroys sun. You know, it's just like this insanely reckless dick measuring contest between two world superpowers over who could destroy the world more efficiently, well, basically. thankfully, it's over now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the past. So this is, uh, here's a Russian bomb. This was, yep, this was released by the Russians. We call this Main Street America. Vodka, vodka, vodka. Hold on, dude. Their blast is just... Look at that shit. All right. I don't know, dude. I don't know. I think you might have spoken too soon. Oh, they're gonna... Sh oh, hell yeah. It's oh, destroyed. That, that building turned to fucking dust. 12 August 1953. Main Street, America. Oh, 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 oh. So, this, this piece of footage is often attributed... Like, if you go on YouTube... It'll be called the Sar Bomba. And this is an order of magnitude smaller than that explosion. There's actually no footage that's been released from I'm sure that there is probably footage of it somewhere. Oh, yeah. But uh, the US has never Sahara. released. Look at that. Испытание вызвало огромный интерес и волнение во всем мире. В США его окрестили Джо 4. But uh, yeah, there's never been a, there's never been footage of this song. Uh, the house Джо looks fine. It's fine. It's fine. The inhabitants are well. So, yeah, you can see it happening here. It's like, oh yeah, well look at this destruction of the bomb. We knew that there was a colossal and non-trivial work. On the other hand, we didn't appreciate its magnitude. Alright, this is a testing of the Castle Bravo. Yes. There's another U.S. bomb. This is an aerial This is view. the largest U.S. bomb ever tested. Cool. Whoa. So the wave, the energy wave just going out. Yep, the shock wave. Just knocking over anything in its path. Death, 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 death. Whoa. Like I like the music they play. It's like the fucking sun coming up. I always love the footage of the houses that are in this shit, where you just see the house just getting Audio levels. Apart. Yeah, well, I turned them down because that one video was so fucking loud. There you go. The might of America. Damn it. And I mean, once again, this footage suffers from a lack of perspective. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's pretty hard to film something it, yeah. as big as this. I mean, but you can. Oh, oh my god, yeah, it's dude. fine, dude. Fuck you, bridge. Oh, no problem. Holy shit! I just came in my pants. <laughs> Paul's Sunrise gonna, of death. Paul's gonna ride the bomb down, dude. Holy fuck, man. Well, That's just this, like Paul. it's shocking. If you if you if you were riding the bomb, you know, like Doctor Fucking Strange, like did you just ride the bomb down, dude? Yep. When it goes off, I mean, it's just gonna be, you're just gonna be here and then you're just gonna be gone. Well, there's gonna be nothing left of you. It's oh yeah, dude, vaporized it's, instantly. It's like I'm here now. You're, you're, that's it. Two and a half times. Castle Bravo with an. It sounds yeah, like William Bravo. Shatner. It was. It probably <laughs> is William Shatner. Yeah, this is this, this is, is from a PBS series oh. uh, where they colorized all of the bomb footage from these tests. Neat. And uh, had had William Shatner kind of narrate them. It's actually a really good series. The bombs will explode. <laughs> um. So anyway, so this is another Soviet test because you know, like you said, the dick measuring contest yep. was in full swing, and they were both trying to show off their bombs to each other. What was this one called? This is uh. This is the RDS thirty seven. Sure. 
from Russia. So this is a much smaller explosion than the one we just saw. But it's still part of the same. But yeah, it's part of the same. Part of the same dick falling. measuring contest. It's fallen. Check out this bomb, motherfuckers. What's gonna happen? Kachom. Put on your goggles, comrade. So once again, that one's pretty cool because you can see it how they detonated it above ground. Yeah. And then the devastation it immediately wreaked right below it. How come these are always so cool? I mean, it's it's you have to put into perspective too that these are filmed on shitty fucking cameras. You know what I mean? Just the sheer magnitude of this. Yeah, I want an HD. Fuck, how come the government doesn't do this anymore? Show us some bombs, Because it's, it's insanely destructive. Show us some bombs, government. You know, you know why it's so interesting to watch? Because like, what human ever thought they'd be born to see some shit like this? I mean, yeah. Once I mean, again, like, this is so beyond the pale. It goes back to that Baga, Bhagavad Gita quote, you know what I mean? I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. The destroyer. Just the fact that a human being or a group of human beings wields this much power. I am become gluttony, destroyer of Oreos. I love these visions from a city, too. They were trying, you know, and this is all calculated not only to test the bomb's explosion, but these angles are calculated to evoke that imagery in the minds of people, whether it's people at home or people abroad. This is what it would look like if you woke up and looked down your fucking main street and one of these things was going off. But you need to duck and cover, Paul. Duck and cover. Safety first. Move away from windows. Hide under your desk. So for a little bit more about the Cold War, let's take a look at a little brief informational video. Let's learn something, class. This is After about the World Cold War II, War. humanity went from a global military confrontation to another type of war called a Cold War instead of transitioning to a peacetime economy. Specifically, to a conflict which didn't involve direct military confrontations between the main participants, but rather an extensive arms race, continuous tensions, and occasional proxy wars. Ideologically speaking, it was a battle between Marxism and I'm capitalism. I'm glad so much has changed. Lasting until the dissolution of the USSR on the 26th of December 1991, the Cold War was long and extremely expensive. Trump. Over the entire Cold War period, U.S. military purchases amounted to roughly $17 trillion of today's dollars. And while reliable figures for the USSR are hard to come by, they've most likely spent less in nominal terms, but more as a percentage of their gross national product. In the end, the USSR collapsed under its own weight, as their over-centralized planning just didn't work. Collective farming was such a failure that the once powerful food exporter became a significant food importer. Industrial production and innovation suffered due to rigidity, and Russia went from being the first nation to send a satellite it, to space it, in 1957 like to being surpassed by Japan in and Germany, who had lost World War II. At its high point in 1969, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty, the USSR represented 14.31% you know I mean? of the world. Kind of how far, how close the USSR was in terms of power to the United States for a very long time. Um, you know, they sent Sputnik, the first uh, satellite, into space before we were able to accomplish such a feat. So, you know, it really was... the the, the I didn't really pull much about it, but the space race was a big part of the Cold War. Because, oh, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of it wasn't about all the wonder and exploration and human desire to reach out into the void. It was about... Fuck you, who, Russia. Yeah, who's going to be the first one to get missile bases on the moon? You know what I mean? That's really what it was about. It was about who can claim that fucking thing oh, floating dude. up in the sky as a military just, outpost. Just, just say tomorrow, like, China will go to Mars and, and, and the mil they're going to have a military base on Mars. And suddenly the U.S. will be like... It like, we gotta get to Mars. We gotta get to Mars. Yep. Mars. 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 It'll be it'll be our first fucking thing. You know, our first priority. The, the, you know, people talk about the, like, kind of like the Star Trek utopia. Like that that only happens in America if you know we're like, oh shit, there's gonna be China or Russia's gonna be there first. No, we can't let that happen. Oh, for the sake of scientific exploration and study and the betterment of humanity. Ah, oh, that's secondary. We gotta have weapons to kill everything. But yeah, I mean the the USSR basically just collapsed under its own weight. But the great thing about it is that basically none of those nuclear weapons were decommissioned when the the country fell. A lot of them fell into other states' hands, and most of them are still active. So really nothing changed in terms of geopolitics when it comes to nukes. Uh, he kind of mentioned the proxy wars that were part of this the Cold War. This is insane. When I was pulling this, I, I, you know what, dude? I did not realize how much of this shit was going on. How many wars, you know, how much these two countries use other 
countries as chess pieces in their little oh, game. They, I mean, look, so here's look a at Europe. list of Cold War proxy wars. Yep. So the Chinese Civil War, China, China was supported uh, by the Soviet Union um, and won that. The Greek Civil War. Um, we like to sponsor a lot of civil wars. Yep. The Iran crisis of 1946, Soviet Union and the United States again. U- U.S. pulled ahead on that one, I guess. The first Indochina War, once again, Soviet Union and China on one side, United States on the other. They won that one. You can see the back and forth, but none of these were hot wars between, well, not not none of them. There were some that ended up being hot wars. But for the most part, it's but I'm just talking like about we not between, never between our own little, our own little state. Well, well, we, the, well, the idea was they're going to spread communism and we have to stop it. When you're looking at all of these, you see the, the parties that were involved. I really like this graphic, but you also see supported by, you may as well just say, those are the people that funded this war and made it possible. So while the United States and Russia never faced each other militarily, they just used every other country to do that. Well, yeah. the, well, it was, it and was, China's usually involved too. It was a mutually, uh, you know, assured destruction. That's the, well, that's what you were facing. So it's like it's the same thing. It's like you know, Russia thinks okay, even at this point in this day and age, like we're talking about modern times, that that, that they'd rather fight in Syria and other places because they know if the U.S. and Russia goes to war, I mean, it's World War Three. Uh, Myanmar, Myanmar, they were talking about ongoing. This is ongoing. Nineteen forty-eight to present. The Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, 1948 to present, I would say even longer that, I, I have that. a feeling that's going to say ongoing for a very long time. Yeah. The Korean War, stalemate, yep. So that this was one of the one of the biggest of the proxy wars prosecuted uh, by the United States and, and Russia with North Korea and South Korea. This one was pretty much just us two yep. fighting it out. Oh my God! Second Indochina War. I mean, the list goes on and on. Look, Look at, at all, all the motherfuckers getting involved in this yeah. shit. Yeah, and and think about the like I couldn't find numbers, but the cumulative dead from all of these proxy wars would be a staggering number to see. And all of this funded by and it basically just goes on and on two sides of a conflict: the United States on one side and our allies, the Russia and its allies on the other. Sand and this war. list is just. Endless. Look at this. I mean, it just goes. It goes on, on and on. And we could sit on here and spend and the entire fucking on. show just reading about proxy wars that have been fought during the Cold War. So this is way bigger than people give it credit for. A lot of times, when when people talk about the Cold War, they talk about it just being an arms race, but it was way more than that. It was. A giant, I mean, like... Stop talking about it in the past tense, because it's still going. Well, yeah, that's that's the thing. All, a lot of these you saw ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. This is still going on. People are talking about when's World War Three going to happen. I think it's been going on for a very long time. And it's just not being prosecuted like a direct war. So it's gone under the radar, but... Because we keep at all using of other those countries as the chess pieces. Endless pages of fucking conflict. With both of us, you know, with the United States on one side and Russia on the other, and China, and just pitting people against one another for our own geopolitical positioning, it's pretty sickening shit. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, kind of the, it's kind of in the playbook of you know, you know, great superpowers for the last two hundred years. Though it's you know they're colonize and then fight wars there, or now it's you know like okay, now we're gonna support this group in this country, and you're gonna support this group, and those two groups are gonna fight it out. And maybe we win, maybe you win, but then we're going to start another one over here. And that's all Syria is. People talk about Syria. It's like Assad would have been gone a long time ago if Russia wasn't propping him up. Oh, yeah. We it, all know that. And then the, and Iran is obviously backing Assad, and we're and Saudi Arabia is backing the rebels, and we're backing them. But that all could shift. It could be all suddenly these people are more favorable to the U.S., so we're going to back them and give them arms. I mean, Afghanistan is part of that, too. Oh, I mean, of course. Prior, prior to our invasion of Af- Afghanistan, we were funding the Mujahideen or Mujahideen. Yeah, Osama bin Laden. Yeah, let's the for, CIA. Yeah. People, we trained Osama bin Laden to fight the Russians, and he used the skill that he, he learned oh, and that's from what he us lo- to that, that, destroy that, us. That's what he loved. America. Oh, Osama bin Laden used to love America. You know, have you ever actually looked at the uh, the files they've released on, uh, when they actually killed Osama bin Laden, like the stuff he was watching? 
He was a, he was watching shit about like like where in the world is Osama bin Laden and shit. He also had a Steam account and porn too. <laughs> oh yeah, lots of porn too. Well, I mean, of course he's a guy. He's gonna look. I mean, Osama bin Laden was looking at porn. Yeah, but he's pre he's he's a member of a religion that thinks that that's filthy, dude. Well, it's okay for him. He's one of the. I leaders. mean, just, got it. Yeah, but does he really? I mean, right. yeah. I mean, I mean, look. A lot of these people say this shit, but the people and the head of these terrorist organizations they don't believe a lot of this, this shit. Is kind of sort it's of a power scheme, sort of unrelated. But I, I kind of wondered the other day. We're, me and we were talking about uh. Some of these guys, me and Paul were kind of doing this bit on um, on the TG Des Life thing where we were going back and forth pretending to be conservatives and shit. Yeah. What do you mean we're, pretending, TJ? Well, you know, we were, I know, I know we you were, were revealing Paul, our true selves. When you and Paul are off, I mean, you guys are like these fucking liberals ruining this country. But, but go ahead, yeah. yeah. But uh, I, I was kind of wondering, like, do people like, uh, you know, uh, Rick Wiles and uh, Jim Baker and stuff, you think they, like, when, when they, they go to office, they're voting for the Democrats because they want to... Drum up that fear, like when they're in the little ballot box. Well, are you asking? Are there people who just make their career? Uh, well, I'm just saying it's like they got to know it's way better for them if the person who's not even really actually liberal but perceived as being liberal wins, it's a, it, so that they can drum up that like, oh shit, they come and take your guns it's a, it's and they come and do this. I don't think so because it's really irrelevant because they're going to spin whatever narrative they want. If it's a Republican, then it, things are going to be great, but then it's the rest of the world that's going to be threatened, or it's going to be calamity that's going to threaten it. When I it felt come, like conservatives it, were kind of pigs and shit when Obama was in there. For though. sure. Yeah, you have to take that into account. Like, for conservatives or, and liberals, I mean, there's no better time to be a talk radio person or a media pundit type of person when yeah. the opposition is in power. Because then you're the underdog, you know, then you're the guy that everybody's rooting for, then you're speaking truth to power and all that bullshit. Yeah, they you know what it. I mean? They love it. So, I mean, but it's all just a chess. They, they know it's a back and forth. They know it's constantly, the pendulum is constantly going to swing from left to right. Swing this way, swing that way. Anyway, they, uh, our Patreon, by the way, is at uh, 2012. Boom. It's wow. happening, guys. 12-hour fucking show. Prohibition is happening, and now the 12 hour show yep, is so happening. Yep, so next month will be a 12 hour show. This month cool. we'll be getting wasted and trying to do a show on Prohibition. <laughs> we'll try. Let's have something about that amendment. Which one was it? I mean, you can see how well we do it, uh, uh, According, providing a cohesive narrative totally sober. There seems to be a, um, well, a contingent totally. in the chat that, uh, you know, is letting it me. It's, they're kind of woke, and they know that what's really going on here is uh, the Jews. Really? Yeah, it's the Jews. I don't think it's the Jews, the Jews. dude. <laughs> the Jews. The Jews. I don't think the con- Jews instrument like. Uh, well, the Jews control the entire planet, Paul. So. All right. <laughs> citation as, as, needed. As, uh, as part, well, I'm part of the Jewish elite, so I oh, know okay. that. I mean, well, I am. I am an. Citation not not needed. Dude, I am in fact. Well, you can challenge me on that, Paul, but I'm in fact one percent Jewish. I did the, see that on your report, so I won't challenge that. I mean, if you want to challenge me, Paul, I mean, look. I'm, get, no, I'm 0% Jewish. Well, I so thought you're not, I was you're not part have of the little, club. You're not part of the club. I'm not. Paul, you're not part of the club. I got none of that. You're not part of the special club, Paul. And you never As a car carrying Jew, I can tell you, Paul, we control everything. Just remember okay. that. Well, the more you know. So as uh, this arms race was going on and all these proxy wars were happening and stuff, here at home... Um, we experienced something called uh, McCarthyism. Um, basically, the Red Scare. Yeah, the Red Scare. All of the it was mostly uh, Hollywood being targeted by. Um, sen- well, actually, we got a video that explains the whole fucking thing here. Fear grips the country. Take Not only look. fear of communist infiltration, I'm but scared. fear of being suspected of communist leanings. It is a climate that makes possible the rise of Joseph McCarthy, first-term senator from Wisconsin. I don't know if you guys ever seen that movie. Um, good night and good luck. Yeah, good night and good yep. luck. They showed beautiful film. They showed clips of Joseph McCarthy in the film, um, and uh, one of the th- when they screened the film for test audiences, they're like, "We like the movie, but we thought the guy that played Joseph McCarthy was way over the top." <laughs> it's just like it's actually him. yeah, it's actually, it actually him. They actually use real footage of him, so people were like, "He, he was just ridiculous." I think you guys kind of, you know, straw manned him a little. <laughs> Even if there are only one communist in the State Department, there could still be one communist too many. What we call McCarthy yeah. is really political slander. And it didn't begin with McCarthy. He did not invent it. There are lots of traditions in American history where people accuse another party of he being wrote the fucking treasonous. Of course. I get the impression that while you are quite an actor, you play for a laugh. I don't think you have any conception of the danger of the communist party. 
Until this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. It's an interesting psychology about why these well-born people become the targets uh, of such wrath. Uh, and Joe McCarthy is very clear about this. There's no one he despises more than the men in striped pants born with silver spoons in their mouths. So he did this out of a kind of a misplaced sense of class warfare almost. <laughs> he he did he really did he looked at this he was like you know the Russians are all, we're in this war you know this Cold War with the Russians this arms race and they're stealing secrets from us and who are they recruiting to do that and and for him the answer was the top echelon of society you know what I mean it was like those rich fucks those rich bastards in Hollywood and entertainment and and all of this well it's always you know fear is such a powerful motivator and you you can just turn that into people are really afraid of the destructive power of the bomb you know they've seen what happens when you have Nagasaki and Hiroshima everyone knows about that you know people are so worried that Russia's gonna we're gonna go to war with Russia at any second and he's just like look there's these communists everywhere we have oh my god you could be a communist you're a communist right. people are fucking testifying in front of Congress this the well, crazy thing is, is too, uh, when I was a kid, you know, it was pretty much everyone agreed that McCarthy was full of shit and he was a bastard. Well, of course he was. But it, since, uh, as I'm, you know, over the years, like in the last like 10, 15 years, like the conservatives have started to try to reform McCarthy's image. And, you know, he was actually right. Yeah. He was actually right. He was vindicated what he did, man. Yeah. And, and well, that's because that type of thought has come to rise again you know what i mean it's just cyclical the cold war never really stopped it paused for a few years while the former ussr rebuilt itself so that you i mean like basically well, you, well, you have, eventually you have fatigue we paused to take a little breath and now we're right back to the same atmosphere of like Fear and suspicion people, at home and proxy well, you know, wars and bullshit abroad. Well, you know why that is. People die. People get sick of it. Then you have a generation that's raised on this shit and like, man, enough of this fucking shit. The image, then, the, then the other next generation comes, they forget about all this shit. And they're like, yeah, let's do that. Fuck it. Doesn't matter. Yeah. The farther back in the past this type of shit gets, the less it starts to look like history that we should learn from. And the more it just becomes obscured by, you know, this general malaise that people have for history. And it just happens again. And continues to happen. Well, that's that's why they have all those sketches on YouTube. And it was, you know, the, first it was late night talk shows where they go around like, who fought the Civil War? And it's like, Japan. You know, <laughs> yep. it's just like people are just ignorant. A lot of people don't know shit about fucking history. They don't, they don't, you know, they say, you know, if, if you ignore history, you're doomed to repeat it. And a lot of people just don't even know history. So they can't, they, they can't ignore it. They just, they're ignorant of it. They, they have no idea what's going on. They have, I mean, they don't know what's going on now. They don't know what's happened before. So, they, so, I mean, they're just fucking totally ignorant, uneducated fucks. And they're just like, you know what? I don't know about that. You know, Trump bombed it. It must be good. I mean, he's the president, right? I don't fucking know. I don't know what the fuck is going on. I've heard the other end of the argument coming out of modern conservatives, too, that the um, kind of investigation into possible Trump yeah. involvement is McCarthyism That's reborn. That's the new McCarthyism. It's the Red Scare all again, you know? Like, Yeah, I mean, it's just crazy how quickly people's narratives will shift depending on what suits their needs at that, at that particular moment. Well, especially in today's society where everyone wants to make a snap judgment and go, I'm on Twitter, this is bullshit, I don't like this, I don't agree with this, I've made a full judgment call based on no almost nothing. And we don't really have a historical historical parallel in terms of like congressional hearings and Muslims being dragged before the Congress. But you can see some of the para parallels in terms of fear and paranoia amongst the populace after the 2001 terrorist attacks against Muslim people. I mean, this was a this was a scary country to be Muslim in for a couple of years after those fucking uh, towers went down. Um, there was a lot of really just on the surface anti-Muslim sentiment that really echoes this time. You know, I mean, it's over a different thing. This is a political ideal versus, but I mean, you know, Islam is kind of a blend of political ideals and religious well, that's ideals. That's the whole anyway. thing about Islam is it's kind of like not just a religion; it's also got right. a political system built into it. So you can see kind of the parallels there: the xenophobia and the fear of the other, and the kind of stripping of rights of people. Because they might be associated with the, the Patriot Act. Yeah, I mean, all the NSA spying. I mean, just a justification to spy on the, the civilian populace, a justification to monitor everything you do. 
And I mean, look, and, and, and it's like this whole fa Facebook thing came out. And it's like this company was looking at everything your people were doing. It's like, no shit they were. What do you think they were doing with all your information? <laughs> and then Zuckerberg gets to sit there and go, we kind of messed up on that. I don't I'm really sorry. know. Mm. We didn't do our due diligence, and I'm sorry for that. Because Mark Zuckerberg is a fucking lying sack of shit. They knew exactly what they were doing. He's a sack of circuitry. He's not. He, I, I described him on Hideology one night as, as something that was wearing a human being's skin. <laughs> Like, I don't even know if he's robotic. He just seems like I, something that heavily, put on a human being to, like, he wears Mark Zuckerberg when he needs to. Well, let's to, be you honest. Know? Let's be honest. This country is so corrupt. He, all those questions were given to him in advance. He was, oh, yeah. He was, he was well prepared. He had all the answers, pretty much. I mean, the committee he was answering to was one that he'd actually personally funded for years. What so, a shock. I mean... Mark Mark Zuckerberg, you did bad. Come before Congress. You're a bad boy, oh, Mark. I mean, look, Mark Zuckerberg is so fucking wealthy. You know what's funny? The 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 YouTube shooting. You know what hosp hospital they went to in San Francisco? Uh, San Francisco that was the Mark Zuckerberg Hospital. <laughs> I mean, this guy is fucking wealthy. He has, he has he's paid a ton of lobbyists. He's well connected. He's part of the fucking elite. He's uh, he's not going down. Nothing's he could pretty happening. much and not not to mention. Facebook is working with the government. They work with the NSA. They work with the CIA. They've been briefed on this shit. Oh yeah, Russia ain't the only one that's gotten yeah. data from Facebook. Uh, let's just be honest here. Those it's too good of a resource for them to want to shut it he, down. Yeah, he's not going down for this. No. He's complicit in this. Oh yeah. So it's a bunch of fucking horse shit. Anyone it's a believe? pageant like yeah. this was. Oh look! Oh look! Oh look! We're doing something about it. Look, American people. Look, Mark Zuckerberg came here. Okay, it, well, if there's any justice in this country, Mark Zuckerberg's ass would be in jail, and so all those congressmen with him. I mean, just think about all the endless hearings that went on in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. All the, all the pageantry and all the dragging CEOs in front of to, to be scolded by Congress. And what changed? Not a goddamn thing. Yeah. No one was processed. A, no we, a weak-ass law was passed and then repealed by the next fucking Republican president like that. We passed Dodd-Frank. There's some new rules. Uh, yeah, Dodd-Frank's gone now. We don't like it. Never mind. Back to business as usual, boys. <laughs> We're a little far afield from the nukes, but it's all—all all of this is connected. The pageant that is politics, high obscuring the real, the real fight has—you know, this—it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun in American politics. It's been going on. Yeah, um, the Cold War uh, also yielded the Cuban Missile Crisis, probably the closest we came to. Uh, a nuclear firefight with Russia. This was a scary incident, and it's really hard to kind of... It's one of those things, too, because it's far enough in the past to get into the mindset of people. I mean, like, people at the time thought that they were going to be destroyed. Right. Like, people around America were like, well, we're going to die. I know enough about this to do a basic breakdown of it. Go ahead. So, basically, an American spy plane, knowing that uh, Cuba was a communist government and uh, friendly with the USSR... Um, was doing some routine flyovers because we had noticed through our network of fucking military information that Russia was sending a lot of aid ships to Cuba. And this was not uncommon for Russia to do with other satellite nations that were also communist. But, you know, we're suspicious people, so we did some flyovers, some spy plane flyovers, and whoopsie-daisy found a bunch of ballistic missiles on the island of Cuba that were clearly not made in Cuba, clearly Russian missiles. We didn't know if these were just standard ballistic missiles or if these were nuclear warheads. We assumed that they were probably nuclear. This would have allowed Russia. Cuba is so close to the American mainland. Oh, I mean, yeah. Like the Florida Keys, you can see Cuba from it. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's just I mean, like people just drive boats across yeah. all the time. So it's like, you know what I mean? It would give Russia this insane close strike capability. They could just dot Cuba with a bunch of fucking missiles and they would have the ability to do precision strikes on a scale that we could not retaliate. Well, yeah, the, the equivalency would have been like, you know, having fucking nukes in Berlin or something. You know, like, Exactly. It's, it's like right at, the, right, right at the Russians. If we the filled set. Afghanistan with a bunch of fucking nukes, you know what I mean? But they had nothing close to us. We would have a huge tactical advantage in a nuclear oh, war. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the amount of time that it would take the missiles to get to mainland would be way shorter. So we, we could maybe even destroy some of these weapons before 
before they even left the ground. Yeah. So that's what we were facing. And so, uh, of course, America is not going to allow this to happen. Set up what they called a, um, a quarantine because they didn't want to call it a blockade. They were very careful because a blockade is a military term yeah. and would have implied military action against the USSR. And everybody was scared of that. So they called it a quarantine of the island of Cuba and basically sent a bunch of American warships to encircle the island of Cuba and sat and waited. And Russia was like, well, fuck you. We're sending our fucking fleet. So they sent a big supply fleet loaded up with missiles and shit. And uh, it was protected by submarines, by Russian subs. And there was a standoff. And it was real hairy. I think I pulled um, the speech that John F. Kennedy gave well, to that, people. Well, that was a big factor, too, is a lot of people thought that Kennedy was going to be weak. The, the Russians especially, they're like, he'll just cave in and he'll let us do this because he's, he's going to avoid World War III. It was like it was basically who's going to blink first. Well, no one's... I mean, like, you can't allow the, uh, your, uh, the Russians to have a fucking launch point that's that absolutely close to not. The no, no i mean they, it might as well be in fucking kansas at oh, that yeah. point oh yeah it's basically more of a mainland the red threat good evening my fellow citizens this government as promised has maintained the closest surveillance of the soviet military buildup on the island of cuba within the past week unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Only last Thursday, as evidence of this rapid offensive buildup was already in my hand, Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko told me in my office that he was instructed to make it clear once again, as he said his government had already done, that Soviet assistance to Cuba, and I quote, It's kind of weird to have like an articulate president, isn't it? Yeah. To solely the We're going to have the best defense. <laughs> of contributing. To yeah, what would Trump be doing in this situation? Listen, the Russians came over. They sat and, and lied to my face. And they, they, look, they want nukes. They have many nukes, Okay. Uh, you, you terrible, terribly destructive nukes. You have no idea the be the biggest nukes in Cuba, and we can't allow this to happen. We're not going to allow this to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's just, having an articulate president is something that we've kind of, you know, Obama. Almost, uh, you know what Obama, Obama was, was reasonably articulate. I mean, right. and that was that wasn't too long ago. So, but I mean, he's he's definitely not he's not amongst a bunch of articulate presidents in in the modern age. That's for no, sure. To the defense not. capabilities of Cuba, unquote. That, and I quote him, training by Soviet specialists of Cuban nationals in handling defensive armaments was by no means offensive. And that if it were otherwise, Mr. Gamico went on, the Soviet government would never become involved in rendering such assistance, unquote. That statement also was false. Acting, therefore, in the defense of our own security and of the entire Western Hemisphere, and under the authority entrusted to me by the Constitution, as endorsed by the resolution of the Congress, I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. So there you all see the careful of choice of language. Cuba, from whatever nation or well, he also says just military and offensive equipment too. He doesn't say any. He doesn't say any ships, just military offensive. But it was equipment. any ship. Well, yeah. I mean, let's, let's be honest. They're not. They letting weren't it, letting anything in. They're not letting anything in. But yeah, they're, Trump would have been like, "We have formed a blockade. We we'll will stop them. you. We will nuke them. We'll do what we need to do. <laughs> if they come too close, we will nuke Russia." So a lot of people have called this the scariest speech ever given by a head of state. I mean, this is the speech I was talking about. Like, I, I read some. Um, I don't remember which who I was reading someone's uh, autobiography. Um, don't remember who it was anymore, but they were talking about what it was like in the wake of uh, of hearing this speech, and people were just like, "Well, we're dead." Yeah. Well, we're fucking dead. It like everyone's panic. just walking around, like, "Yeah, you know, it was, we're fucked. Had a good run." You, you know, know drinking their beers and shit. The contents of the speech are not overly emotional. Kennedy was very measured in terms of how he presented this because he knew it was going to cause panic. But just the just the implication, people had been so pumped with fear 
uh, about the possibility of a nuclear uh, exchange with Russia, that hearing that it was about to happen, that there it's could imminent. be nukes on, on Cuba, that Russia is now coming with weapons and we're saying, no, you can't come in here and there could be a conflict that yeah, could lead to that. Then, yeah. I mean, people thought it was over. I mean, like, and it, I mean, like, it came so close to being over. Oh, it was on the razor's edge. It actually ended in a legitimate Mexican standoff in the waters surrounding Cuba between a fleet of submarine protected um, Russian military uh, you know supply vehicles and the United States Navy and the X-Men were there and the X-Men were there oh, yes yeah. and Magneto came and fucked up a few of the ships <laughs> it was crazy but you know what I, I think human interest is ultimately the prevailing factor there is because at a certain point it's like does anyone really want this to happen let's all and not it's like, let's not all destroy it's like, ourselves guys. You, know what, you know what though nobody knew N- neither one of these people went in. N- neither one of these superpowers went into it thinking we're going to be the ones that back down. Though, of course not. They were thinking, okay, well, we're going to. Sh- Russia was thinking we're going to show up with all this shit, and we're going to have submarines, and we're going to be like, look, we're going to Cuba. You can't. You don't. You're not the fucking king of Cuba. You can't keep us out of Cuba. And that the United States was eventually going to let him through. And we thought the same thing. We ended up being right. Luckily. Eventually, they did give up. Eventually, the Russians were like, all right, well, maybe this ain't the best idea. And turned around. You know what I mean? But we were on the fucking razor's edge. They could have just as easily ordered their submarines to take out the lead targets in the United States fleet. And it would have been on like Donkey Kong. It wouldn't have been long after that until the nukes flew. Oh, no. I mean, we're talking total annihilation of both countries too i mean all, it, it, both it, countries had tons of fucking and it might not heads aimed at what each you're other saying, it might not necessarily happen at first it might have been the u.s is, is suffering military defeats so now it's like what's well, launched the nukes russia's not going to beat it or the ussr is not going to win or vice versa oh that conflict that conflict would have just escalated if it would have went yeah. hot and they would have fired on each other at that standoff there's no way it doesn't lead to nuclear war. It yeah. escalates in stages. Boom, boom, yeah. boom. Okay, you fucked our fleet up. Well, we're sending more. Oh, you you did that. Well, we're sending bombers to take out your fucking fleet. Oh, oh, you, oh, your military supplies are coming in. Well, we're gonna bomb that. Blah, 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 blah. And then pretty soon, it's just mushroom clouds everywhere. I mean, it's just the dominoes fall so quickly, and we were right there, man. And everybody in the country knew it. Well, the, the, one of the things, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this this fucking episode, um is just because we're back to the point where, I mean, there could be another Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, I mean... <laughs> there's, there, you know, like, what happens if if something like this, uh, something akin to this happens again, and it's Trump? You know, I mean, is, w- it, are cooler heads going to prevail if it's Trump leading our country? We're on the other end of it now. See, we're attempting now to do what Russia was doing then and have these satellite nations that act as military bases, you know what I mean, for our troops. Tons of bases all over the place. So on top of that, you have to take into account people's kind of disillusionment with it. They, they hear this shit all the time, and this is no longer, it no longer has the impact that it used to. But, you know, Trump firing missiles at Syria when he knows that there are Russian military in camp, you know, assets there knows that Russia is backing the regime that he's bombing. I mean, this is tiptoeing around the fucking edge of the same shit. You know what I mean? We've got two nations that are openly pretty hostile towards one another. This is coming on the heels of that uh, assassination that happened in the United Kingdom that they pinned on the Russians immediately. So all this allied, you know, United States and allies sentiment against Russia is at an all-time hot point. We've got this investigation going on here in America. So American sentiment against Russians is at an all-time low because we're hearing more and more how they meddled with our election, you know, and and are fucking with us on social media. So we could be, you know, like very close to to this right now. And it's just not being presented that way. This was a way more honest time. Say what you want about politics. You know, it was always a corrupt shithole. But having a having a president come to his people and say, you know, pretty much we're on we're on the edge of a nuclear war here and you might want to get ready. Yeah, now we just have Trump who was like You're not gonna hear that. I, I, I'm gonna tweet out nuclear fucking threats, you know. <laughs> that type of I will nuke you, Kim Jong un. Yeah, you I mean fat little pig, nu- rocket man. If 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 Kennedy 
had said something like, we're going to fire nukes at you if you don't shut up, there would have been outrage. He would have been fucking ousted from office. But it's been reduced now to our angry little infantile president tweeting about sending nukes and shit. So how could people still have the same level of dread that they have? Even looking at those types of explosions, even looking at how one of these devices could erase 80,000, 100,000, 200, 300,000 people in an instant. What's well, gone so long without it happening, too? So it's I want like- you guys to look at the nuclear uh, armaments of, uh, of us and Russia, respectively, here. So... Um the total weapons, this is all the weapons in the world. Almost all of the nukes are belong to the United States and Russia. Yep. Russia has uh, 6,600. We have 6,450. <laughs> then France has 300. China has 270. The UK has 215. Pakistan has 130. India has 120. Israel has 80. North Korea has under 15. And that's the entire nuclear armament of the fucking world. Yep. Not that many weapons, but when you see that one of these can evaporate a city, it kind of puts into perspective what we're talking about here tonight. Yeah. And I mean, look at the fu- I mean, just and look at the two countries that have this. And remember, the two countries that have the most of these are at each other's throats and fighting proxy wars constantly in the Middle East and abroad and other places abroad. Numerous fucking conflicts, and we're we're getting into yet another proxy war here on the Syria conflict. Now, well, we've of course, been we, in we it. already were in it before, yeah. but we're we have a way more direct involvement now that we've bombed Damascus. Yeah, we're ramping up our presence in this po- proxy. Because before it, we were we were just kind of you know maybe we did we did a couple we did some support bombings I think, and we were funding you know uh, rebel factions and shit. Now we're just outright like we're fucking bombing Syria directly. Yep, we're now. Um, I mean, like, I, I don't know if it's going to escalate into a U.S. versus Syria war. Do you guys remember a news story that when the Syria thing first started out? Because this, this isn't the first time we've done strikes in Syria. Yeah. Trump ordered strikes in Syria. Almost a year ago. Almost a year ago. Do Obama guys, did, too. There was a story that was run on the major cable news outlets, and it kind of got buried by other shit, as is what happens with Trump these days. But it was a story that was eerily similar to the story we just told about this blockade where the United States, in response to Russia, I think, you know, whatever, some had had parked, you know, some ships in a in a position of strength. And there was a fucking Russian fleet heading for them. They had spotted the advanced scouts of a Russian fleet and they'd come back with intelligence that there was this giant combat fleet heading for right where the United States was basing its counter operation. And there was this big question mark of like, well, what's going to happen? And it could have happened again. It was basically the same thing. The Russians came, kind of got to the middle distance, watched for a while, and then turned around and left. So it's just like, we're right there. It's, we're right there again. If that had gone hot, and, and, and think about how easy that could happen. People are fallible things, right? So you've got military commanders there carrying out orders that they're being given from the Kremlin and from the United States, you know, the Pentagon, respectively. Yeah, all it takes is a those couple fallible of human guys to go yeah. like, oh, shit, I'm scared, yeah. you know? Those fallible human beings are processing these orders and looking at the actual situation on the ground, the actual enemy encircling them. You know, like one dude could just go like, oh, fuck, you know, have a moment of panic and see some fucking boat coming and blow it up and it's over for all of us. That's so scary. <laughs> that's like, I mean, that's why uh, the doomsday clock right here. Two minutes to midnight. Two minutes to midnight. Two minutes to midnight. The failure of the world leaders to address the largest threats to humanity's future is lamentable, but the failure can be reversed. It is two minutes to midnight, but the doomsday clock has ticked away from midnight in the past, and during the next year, the world can again move uh, move it further from the apocalypse. I mean, you know, I, I guess we, we could. I don't see any signs that we're going to do it. The warning the Science and Security Board now sends is clear. The danger, obvious and imminent. The opportunity to reduce the danger is equally clear. The world has seen the threat posed by the misuse of information technology and witnessed the vulnerability of democracies uh, to disinformation. But there is a flip side to the abuse of social media. Leaders react when citizens insist they do so, and citizens around the world can use the power of the Internet to improve the long-term prospects of their children and grandchildren. They can insist on facts and discount nonsense. Well, 
Well, I don't. Are you? Is this, People could be smart and well informed. I mean, this is, I mean, this is a fucking fantasy, dude. This is a might, fantasy. might as well move it to a, a minute and a half to midnight. Then you might as well just move it to like yeah, it's, it could be midnight any second now. Just one second to midnight, because you're, if what you're counting on to avoid this shit is a bunch of conscientious people to be like, oh, I, mean, I don't the, know, dude, that's not going to happen. For human civilization to fail, the deck is, is so stacked against us right now. I mean, yep. it, it really, truly is. I mean, take it, I mean look, there's, there's a critical shortage of uh, chemical compounds needed in the upcoming future that's going to happen. Climate change, the threat of war, the threat of disease... There's a lot of shit fucking going against us. I mean, look at the last time, you know, we got this close. The last time the things were this hot, we had th- this kind of leadership. We had, you know, John F. Kennedy as our president. Um, now now we, we have, have Trump. The best. Leader. So this is not exactly cooler heads will prevail. This is well, not exactly a man known for his uh, wisdom. We're going to be fine. Under Paul. fire. Yeah. Let me just go. So we're in fuck. We're fucked, guys. We're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Let me just check Trump's uh, Twitter to see what his most recent tweet is. Sure. Just want to know. I had a burrito. It was good. <laughs> also, nuke Russia. Nuke North Korea. Nuke them. Gotta nuke them all. Donald Trump. He's been doing a lot of retweets lately. Oh, shit. All right, so his last thing. Russia and China are playing the currency devaluation game as the U.S. keeps raising interest rates. Not acceptable. Now he's bitching about Comey. I mean, it's more like that. Now he's bragging about a Rasmussen poll that he where he's that he's actually popular in. I mean, the first one that you read that's saber rattling against Ch- uh, China and Russia. They're fucking with us. Yeah, look Fuck at them. they're fucking with us. So it's happening. Like it's just you know, we don't we don't learn, man. We never learn. We just keep repeating our past mistakes over and over again, and eventually, you know, it's going to be the last mistake that we get to make. Unfortunately, it's the fucking human condition, dude. You can have as much wisdom as you want, but it, there's always new people in positions of power. I mean, like, like they say, like that. There's the, there's the downfalls of democracy is that it can be influenced. You can have a demagogue like Trump be elected, who will tell you, "Look, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. This country's under attack. I'm going to keep us strong. I'm going to keep us safe. Let's make this country great again." And it, and it resonates with certain people because there's a lot of people who really love America. They love the freedom and ideals that America, in their mind, represents. Yeah. But ultimately, they don't really. It, it's a nebulous concept because it doesn't really mean everything to the same person. It's all your perception of what that means. Yeah, I, I had a. Um, I got the, I got really high one night. Oh, and I fucking. You mean you mean every night? <laughs> well, no. I mean this is a particular kind of high. I got a really paranoid high, and uh, the thing I randomly became paranoid about was uh, the nukes are coming. They're coming. They're, they're just coming. Like nuke, I just nuke, felt nuke, like nuke, this. Nuke, 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 this nuke. certainty. Nuke, nuke. In my fucking belly, like the nukes are coming. They're, they're fucking. They're At any inbound. second now, I'm gonna see the flash outside the window, fiber, and fiber. then I'll have about three seconds to contemplate. Oh shit! And then boom, I'm gonna be destroyed. I must have sat there for about an hour, just like shaking and like it's coming. Just tied in oh, knots. It's over coming! The oh my god! Oh my god! It's coming! It's gonna happen. Took me a while to talk myself out of that. Did Paul be outside like this? I don't know what it was. There was nothing going on in the world at that time that was like the nukes might fly. The cleansing soon. fire of the nuke washes my sins away. I mean, there should be shit all the time, and the and the, you know what I mean. This should be something that the media pays way more attention. to. I just to. feel like it's so inevitable that something is going to happen with with you know, you know if we do nothing arsenals. to stop the spread of these things then it is because think about it we looked at that that list right a lot of those countries have nowhere near the arsenal that we have but no. they're allied with us so all it takes is that somebody in one of these other satellite countries that have a, a smaller nuclear arsenal one of those is india and pakistan that's a war there that's a conflict uh, another cold war of sorts that's been going on for fucking ever where there's a lot of instability in the governments. And they both have nukes. And they both have nukes, and they both have nukes pointed at each other, and there's border conflicts and shit. It's just a matter of time. One of the things that freaks me out the most, we didn't pull anything about it, but Russia has an entire uh, automated strike system that's supposed to... Like a dead man switch. Yeah, it's supposed to do a counter-strike. If it detects a nuclear strike on Russian soil, it's supposed to do a counter-attack. 
Um, now, there is, I think, some kind of human element, like some human is supposed to engage it once it auto-engages. It's not supposed to just do it all on its own. But it, they continue to maintain that system to this day. And it's basically what it is. It's just it sends a whole shitload of warheads over to the United States. Just, all right. They've, Indiscriminate. They've destroyed, they've destroyed us. So now we're launching an automatic counterattack that, you know, like one dude, I think, somewhere has to, like, you know, press a button. Like, oh, we've been attacked. Press the button. And then the counterstrike is launched. Russia continues to maintain that system to this day. They haven't, like, dismantled it or anything. So that's still in place. You've got to believe the U.S. has the same thing. Oh, we've got similar systems for sure. I mean, that that movie we watched uh, a few weeks ago, War Games, is all all really about that. It's kind of a a silly, you know, anachronistic 80s look at it. But really what that movie is about is the unreliability of the human element when it comes to a nuclear strike. That movie starts with a scene of two dudes sitting in a nuclear missile silo just sipping their coffee and talking about how their wives fucking suck. And then all of a sudden the fucking alarms go off. And both of these dudes have to put a key in and turn it at the same time to order the launch and one of them won't do it you know what i mean so it was a movie about how we were going to automate the, our response nu- in a nuclear well, way because a- we couldn't rely on human beings to be able to handle the weight of turning a key that they know is going to evaporate 80,000 to 300,000 people well, that instantly was, that was also a big thing was um this guy challenged like he's like well what if i think the order is unlawful what, like what if i don't like, agree like let's say there's a trump in office and trump's like nuke north korea and then you're you're giving the order and you're like you know i don't want to do it i don't think we should see from a command standpoint that no. can't happen yeah that, that that's exactly what it is like and the guy was actually thrown out of the military for it because it's like no you're not allowed the president it's like well there's anyone that can stop the president and it's really no they can't if, when Trump's, or- if Trump says nuke someone right now. Yeah. When the order goes out, if it's your job to do something to facilitate that missile going up, you, you do, do it. it. Yep. And it rests all in the hands of one person. Yeah. Like the, way our, the, way, the way the power is, is structured is if Trump says nuke this, there's no, no one can fucking stop him from doing it. So now, Trump in just terms woke up of with a like wild a, hair up his ass and said nuke North Korea. Or, in terms of like a preemptive nuclear strike, I don't know if that's the case. Can he just wake up one morning and grab the football and hit the button? <laughs> I mean, that's my understanding. Uh, yeah, probably so. I'm not. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure on that, but that's been my understanding. I mean, you could say heard. like maybe, maybe legally, you know, the Congress has to has to declare war or something. But Trump could just say, "I am emergency powers. I have to do this to protect the country." Right. That National that whole security. war powers thing has been established now. The president can just go to war. Like he didn't. He didn't seek con- con- I mean, congressional done, approval for this strike on Syria. Yeah, I mean, which yeah, normally in times past w- he would have had to. We've had tons of uh, strikes on foreign powers without congressional approval at this point. So I think that precedent is pretty much dead. Um, I just wonder if it differs a little bit when nukes are involved. Or I don't not. know if it does. We. I mean, well, they, they voted. They voted for the war in Iraq, and of course that 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 vote passed. Even though we all know that's a fucking that was a disaster. I mean, it's still ongoing an ongoing disaster. Yeah, I mean that's and Hillary voted for it too. Um, anyway, that's, we've pretty much gone everything through everything we have. That's uh, the nukes. The you know, I mean, nukes, there's dude. probably there's a lot of other elements we could have gotten into, nuke, but nuke, 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 nuke. That at least gives people a a quick little history of why we're yeah. fucked. Yeah, this is basically why we're fucked and how how we got to the point we're at now. Yeah. And how similar it is to points we've been at in the past. In researching this, I had a profound sense of deja vu when reading about a lot of this stuff. And I hope that at least some of you in the audience felt the same thing as we kind of went through this shit. You know, just how many parallels there are between the shit that's already happened and the shit that's going on right now when it comes to these weapons. You don't hear about them a whole lot, but they're still one of the major things, if not the most critically major immediate thing threatening us as a species why do you think they're still in north korea <laughs> well, of i mean that's why well, i think they're still in pakistan yep all right well thank you guys for watching hopefully uh we'll you'll get to the uh, wednesday and friday episodes before nuclear annihilation yeah, yeah if you want to see the friday episode assuming the bombs don't come become a patron you get the friday episode and a bunch of other shit yeah we've updated our patreon Starting go check it next out next month and uh, you'll you'll see all the stuff we've added for our patrons here. Also, TJ's a faggot. Yes, yes, such a faggot. Mm-hmm.